Welcome to the Pain Points Podcast. We tell the stories of small businesses, the people that run them, and the journey they are on. Our purpose is to gather a new perspective on starting, growing, maturing, and maintaining businesses of all sizes. So grab that cup of coffee, sit back, and join us as we start the conversation. Welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Sarah Harbuck, and filling in for Kristen Ellis is our producer, Megan Harbuck, today. Good morning. And we have Tim Bryan of The Boss Light. Hello. Hello. He is back again to talk about what it's like to be a writer. Um, He was here uh, a few weeks back um, and was on episode 135, if you want to check that out, where he talked about his bookstore and all the things leading up to that. And we got so interested uh, during that episode about his writing and his process that we were like, we need to do a whole other like extra episode just about you as a writer. So thanks for coming back. And I uh, I appreciate being invited. (laughs) Sharing all the trade secrets that that uh, that you've learned over the years being a writer. So let's kind of recap a little bit. Um, You have written how many books? Well, you know, I have to count in my head every once in a while I'm not sure I think I'm writing my 11th novel right now okay. I'm almost through I think it's the 11th one gotcha. the problem is a couple of them haven't been published yet so when you start counting the ones that have been published plus the ones a couple that haven't been I think I'm, I've written 11 Golly. I've published I think nine. So, oh wow so that's yeah yeah, and you have what genre are you? Do you, would you say that you tend to write more, most in? Well, mostly uh, the, the the most inclusive thing you could call it is mystery. Uh, several of them are uh, private detective novels, mm-hmm. which really are in the mystery genre. Sure. And then I've written a couple of westerns, but even those tend to be mysteries. I find out that you know just about everything I write, even if it's a western. You know, the has cow- a sort the of a mysterious element well, to yeah, it. Yeah, the cowboy's solving a mystery or something, you know. So <laughs> right. I, I tend to just, re- that's the way I think, you I guess. Gravitate towards that particular type I, I, of story. I obviously do. <laughs> I mean, to me personally, those are my favorite when there's some sort of like thing that's introduced in the beginning and you have to solve this, you know, puzzle along the way. You know, right. that's why shows like Sherlock or Criminal Minds or, you know, any of that is really intriguing to me. So. Yeah, I, I, I really don't know if I know how to write anything but a mystery. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what else is there to write about, you know. It's, right, right. Yeah. And somebody asked me that one time. I thought, well, you know, really, I thought about it. I think, you know, life itself is a mystery. So anytime I'm writing about life, mystery just seems to kind of poke its head up. Yep, you know? definitely. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's talk about your very first book. Um, okay. what was the title of that and when did you write it? Uh, it, it was called Dutch Courage and it's still out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I published it in 2010, wrote it in 2009, uh, maybe a little bit of 2008. I mean, you're wearing the shirt. I'm actually wearing the shirt. <laughs> yeah. I'm the only one in the world that has this shirt. I Love mean, it. I, I, That's yeah, awesome. Self-advertising right there. <laughs> At its finest. I don't wear this shirt very often, but I thought, well, it's appropriate today. Yeah, and I like that. Is that the the book cover right there? That is the, uh, not the current edition. It's the second edition. It's gone through three editions now. Oh, wow. This is the cover for the second edition. Very good. Yeah. And you wrote that how long ago? Uh, 2008. Well, what happened, I I graduated from uh, Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches Mm -hmm. in 2007 with a degree in in a creative writing right uh and my thesis had been a a series of connected short stories based on this character named dutch courage Uh so when i got out i thought well what i will do is i'll stitch all of those little short stories together and make a novel and put it out what i discovered was that did not work at all (laughs) not at all it'd be like a collection of short stories but not necessarily a novel, right? Right, right. And I wanted a novel. Mm-hmm. And, and just using them as connected short stories, nothing seemed to really work right. So we finally, uh, well, we being the royal we, I finally decided this is not going to work and threw it. Well, didn't toss it away, but uh, tossed it aside and started all over on a complete new... Uh, so I started maybe the end of 2008, 2009, and it came out in 2010, and it was the first Dutch Courage novel. So doing some quick math there, 
uh, you've basically written a book a year if you're yeah, up to 11. That's about right. Almost. That's about right. That's incredible. Um, well, when I look back at it, I'm like, well, no, I didn't do that. No, not, not, not. And then I think, well, yeah, I yeah, did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember doing that. It, it's one of those weird things. Is when I look back, I'm like, I don't remember doing all of that. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but then I start counting them up. I'm like, well, yeah, I did, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing to me because, you know, there's some of the, my favorite authors that take some years to write one particular book. And the fact that you were cranking them out that, that quickly, I guess you could say, although some people would say, well, a year is a long time, and it is. Um, there were a few years in there where I didn't write a novel, so there have been two or three years where I wrote two novels. Oh, wow. Yeah. When wow. I wrote the first Dutch Courage novel, real quick story, I thought it was one and done. I thought that was, the, when I it finished that novel, the ending of the novel, I thought was the end of Dutch, as far as writing, I mean, he didn't die, but... I thought that the story was, the was end complete of it. I in your that, mind. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it took a couple of years for me to write the second one. So uh, the second one came out in 2012, or even maybe 2013 by the time it came out. Wow. So. Uh, so there was a little bit of a gap, but. Yeah, there's, there was a little gap. There's been gaps here and there, but by and large, it's averaged out to about a, a book a year. Gotcha. Yeah. So how many books are in the Dutch Courage series? Uh, well, there's interesting answer here. <laughs> There's four, okay? What happened, we, we did four books, and recently my agent and I signed the four books to a, a new publisher. That's why we got the new third edition. Right, right. So the first two are out. The second one's coming out like next week. It should be out very soon, probably before this uh, podcast is out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Spirit Trap. And then the fourth one will come out later this year. But what ha something interesting happened. After Speaking Volumes signed me to do the four, uh, to re-release them, they came back to me and said, now that we got these four, would you be interested in writing a fifth new one for us? Wow. And I said, uh, well, darn right, yeah. <laughs> where, where do I sign, you know? Because I, I, I was already thinking along those lines. I think there's a fifth story to be told. Uh -huh. so, I, so I wrote it and just finished it within the past two or three months. Good deal. Uh, I, what, I guess January, I think I finished uh, the fifth one. So it will come out after these four come out. They're, they're kind of staggering them every three or four months. They're putting one of them out. Well, that brings up an interesting uh, point. What is your writing process? Because I have listened to lots of interviews of authors. I've read lots of interviews, and they all seem to have there's like four or five just methods that they all tend to follow in, in some form or fashion. Some of them, you know, are very meticulous with an outline right, and right. really writing out character descriptions and getting really prepared. And then they take that information, and they put that into the novel. Right. Others just sort of start writing and whatever comes, comes. And, and then and there's variations in between of the both of those extremes. So where do you fall on the spectrum? I definitely do not do outlines. <laughs> I, I'm more the other guy. Okay. Um, uh, I got a good friend that's a writer, Joe Lansdale. We both kind of write the same way, and we I've talked to him, him about it, and we both agree if we sit down and write the the outline, and uh, and I know a lot of writers do this, and it's there's no right way. Everybody sure. has their own way. You have but, to find a method that works but, for you. But but what works for me is just sitting down, and and it's like I'm I've got a boat and I'm going in a direction. I point it in the direction I want it to go. And from there on, I'm just hanging on. And then do you and, just like start writing? And then it is, and once and it, the inspiration is over, that's yeah, when you stop. Yeah. What I was going to say is what I found out is if I write that outline out, I feel like I've written the story. You're trapped. And I've discovered it. And I know I'm just no longer interested in it. Oh. I'm like, oh, I don't even want to write it now. Okay. I, I'm, it's lost its appeal. It's lost that magical quality. I kind of like discovering it the same way the reader would discover it as they as they. Uh, so how do you deal with it? continuity issues when you're writing on the fly like that as, as the inspiration comes? Because I would find, I mean, do you go back and reread what you've written and kind of make sure that things match up as the story progresses or? Uh, yeah, I, when I have to, I do that. Mm -hmm. I, I try not to get myself into that corner where I have to stop, and, but it does happen. I mean, and, uh, it, depending on how, like, what type of book, you know, how many characters and all their interconnecting connecting storylines and, and things can, like that. It, yeah, it can get kind of confusing even for me, and I do have to go back. Do Thankfully, you have, like, notes that you just sort of I, jot down? And... Yeah, <laughs> or, or no, yes or no. <laughs> no. As the case may be, I often no, and I have to go back and, and search. Thankfully, I've got a girlfriend now who uh, has written, uh, has written, has read the books, 
And sometimes I can go to her and say, do you remember what happened with this character or did this character do, you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, beyond that. Uh, I guess you, know, you get so immersed in this world you create that you. Well, you get you to can, know the characters. Yeah, you kind of remember. And, and I, I would just. I think you get, the, you get, you remember the important things. Yeah. And the not so important things. Well, sometimes they do come up to bite you and you have to take some time out and go back and. And and I do that. Yeah. I mean, and I'm sure happen. an editor will kind of be reading along, going, "Oh, sure. Wait a second. Yep. You in yep. book two, you, he was doing this, and you've got him doing yes. this other thing over here. That, we got to fix that." That, <laughs> that has happened. Absolutely. A good editor will catch things like that 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 I don't catch. Right. And because you're the creative, you're just making the product, and and then they sure. they're the ones responsible for all the fine details. Right? You know, I, I had a, <laughs> I had a really good editor with Kensington in New York. They, I did two. Uh, two westerns for them mm -hmm. and uh, I, I had a fantastic editor up there it, i mean i guess you know they it's all in-house they pay for their own editors and all that stuff so uh he contacted me and we were going through the book and and he said now on this page you've got him walking up such and such street but i've mapped it out and it should be he should be one block over on this other street if he's going up to the church <laughs> and i'm like oh my gosh you yeah. you i mean he really took his job seriously yeah <laughs> you know yeah i mean people who read a lot will notice those things like yeah. wait a second there's an issue there you know sure. um i think there was a thing recently i saw on tiktok about one of the harry potter books and um, there was a continuity issue in sure. one of the very early publications that they had to correct, so then second right. and third editions didn't have that issue in it. Right, and that does that so does she, happen. Yeah, and so uh, you know, it's it's just funny that that happens on any level, to, you know, regardless of the the author's success. I'm sure right. it, it does. <laughs> Where you're just in the moment creating this story, and you're being real creative, and you're not really worried about all those little you know namby pamby details. That's why you have editors and sure. proofreaders, and <laughs> and if you're somebody like George R. R. Martin, you know, who does the Game of Thrones, I think he like pays a whole team of team people. of people who keep up with continuity and, and know all the little details that he can't possibly remember because you know his, his uh storylines are much more involved than mine and he's now got, mine are just simple little you know pu uh, private detective novels <laughs> so not quite that level of uh you know, yeah, well, detail. you know, when he, you're a multimillionaire, you can probably afford a, you can a afford, team of that's people. Right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, his books are, they're heavy duty. They're very hard to get through. There's so many people. I had to, like, make notes when I was reading those sure. books and look up things Absolutely. on the internet to figure, I was like, who is, wait, who is this person and who are they, how are they related? To, right. Yeah, it was it was a lot to get through. Um, so I like simpler storylines, to I be do, honest. I do, That's, I do too. It appeals I, I to my sense of uh, when I'm reading, I want to relax, you know, right. and get into the world. And if I have to do all this thinking sometimes, it's just, no, nah, it's too much. I, I tend to gravitate toward more s simple stories. And, and that goes whether it's something I'm reading or something I'm watching on, you know, uh, movies. I, I, I don't like it when it gets so detailed that you can't figure out who is who and what's going on, mm -hmm. you know. So I try to keep it. As, as easy as simple as I can, and and, and any story is going to become more involved and more complicated as it goes along, but I try to keep it, you know, within reason. So. Well, I wanted to ask you: you went to school for creative writing. Right now, a lot of authors didn't do that; they just decided to write one day, sat sure. down and write something, or you know, and as famously as Stephanie Meyer says, she had a dream, woke up, started writing about it. Um, what did you learn? in school that has helped you or that what, what kind of techniques did they teach you know that would spark that creativity or help with the writing process that you found were really invaluable and you're glad that you well my, my mentor uh is a professor at sfa uh john mcdermott okay and john has told me before you know tim i never really taught you anything what i did was give you time to practice your craft okay that's and a, now, good, that's now a good way to put it now there's something to be said for that but that's not true he did <laughs> teach me things because I, I always tell him uh now what 14 years after i graduated and i'm writing novels I still have his voice in the back of my head telling me, don't do this, do this. You know, you did that wrong. Or, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, he did teach me things. Uh, funny enough, when I was 10 years old, I was already writing little stories and things. And I remember my grandmother, uh, my mom's mother, who I was very close to in a lot of ways, telling me one day, someday, Tim, you're going to be a writer. You're going to be an author. 
And it took me about 30 more years to figure out she was right, but, <laughs> but she was right. So I think I've always had that gene, you mm -hmm. know, whatever that thing is that makes So you were writing person. even as a child, different yes. things? and Well, yeah. I, I was writing stories, and I started writing songs. I was a musician mm -hmm. uh, to make a short story. I, I was a, primarily a musician and went down to New Orleans and played for a while down there. When I came back here, I was 40 years old and was starting to have children. I've got two kids now. And I thought, well, let's do something a little more mature. <laughs> I, so I jumped out of the, the music uh, the musician thing and jumped right into the author thing which I don't know I think it's like jumping out of one frying pan into another frying sure. pan but uh, but you're just a creative person clearly that that is it was your life path musician uh, author, yeah, you know. it, it seems to be looking back at it I never could figure out what my life path is looking back at it it seems pretty straight and yeah. narrow in a, in a way you right know? sure sure <laughs> who did you yeah. did you read a lot growing up I did who, who sure. were like your favorite authors growing up then? Where, did you read stuff like the Hardy Boys? And oh, I sure like did. Okay, I, I loved the Hardy Boys. There was another series that a lot of people have forgotten along the way. Alfred Hitchcock presents the Three Investigators, oh, yeah. and I fell in love with those. Those still are the, the nearest <laughs> to my those heart. Are good. <laughs> oh, I love those, and I think there were like thirty of them, and yeah. I read them all three or four times. Oh, you man, know, I, I didn't but know. I did read the Hardy Boys. I, I read Nancy Drew. I read all of those kinds of things. Okay, so that was that was a big inspiration and, and for before, you as a kid. And before that, I was reading like Encyclopedia Brown. If yeah. you remember that guy, I, do. I love so, the Encyclopedia Brown. So book. I, I've always been reading, and I've always been drawn toward mystery. I mean, yeah. when you look b back at it, I guess it was more clearly stated than I ever realized. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it was just a big, giant neon sign screaming at you, but, you know, yeah. you know that was just your life at the time. I suppose so, <laughs> yeah. I, so would yeah. you you say you took inspiration from those authors? and? Well, not directly. You don't sit down and think, well, you know, what inspiration can I take from these authors? You just... There, there are a lot of authors along the way, and I mean, those were where, where, where it started, but it ended up with authors like Flannery O'Connor, who was a, probably the biggest influence on me as a writer. Mm -hmm. When I read her short stories, that's when I knew as an adult I want to write, and that brought me back around to writing that. And also, funny enough, the the works of the books of uh, Joe R. Lansdale in Nacogdoches, Texas. Yeah. My dad gave me one of his books one day and said, you ought to read this guy. He's from Nacogdoches. And I read it and fell in love with it because it sound, it spoke my language. It was very East Texas. Yeah. And the humor was very much my kind of humor. And it was the first time I realized, I think, that, oh, a guy from Nacogdoches can write and write well. Mm -hmm. So that, I think... The, things like that started happening to me that really led me back to being a writer as an adult. Gotcha. And and as far as influences go, you know, when I first started writing, I think I, I wrote a lot like probably Flannery O'Connor and even more so Joe R. Lansdale because I had that East Texas thing. But then you realize the world already has a Joe R. Lansdale. It doesn't need two of them. <laughs> and, and knowing him like I do now, the world certainly does not need two Joe R. Lansdales. <laughs> and, 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 so you, you slowly, the more you write, you find your own voice. So you uh, assimilate those those uh, writers that meant something to you, and, and you incorporate them in ways that make sense to you, and then you find your own voice yeah. th through them, I think. Gotcha. Definitely. I, I feel that a lot. I Mom can attest to this. I've, I've always been a writer as well right. since I was like a really little kid. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. I used to have like notebooks that I would fill with stories. There and you I, go. I See, still, that's what I did. I still write today. Yep. And I, I can totally relate to everything that you're saying. I don't copy the authors that I love, but right. I do take a lot of like the voice, like the narration style or sure. the way that it's written. Like I take a lot of inspiration from that. Sure. So I'm I'm... It's nice to hear another author talking yeah. the same way that I do. And I don't write right, outlines right. either. <laughs> well, I just get into it, you know. And that's, I find that's the best way to do yeah. it for me. But for somebody else, it might not be the case, you yeah. know. But but like I said, if, if I write from an outline, I just lose interest in the whole yeah. thing. I, do. I agree. I can yeah. see that being a, a hindrance, you know, yeah. uh, for some. that where, where it's like, well, I already know what's going to happen, so... But for right. some, I've heard, you know, like J.K. Rowling, she was very meticulous very in planning meticulous. out. And she said uh, it, was, it was 
the writing is what connected the dots for her. Sure. You know, filling sure. in, making it full. Sure. You know, where she had like the framework and the skeleton with this outline and then, sure. you know, building the walls and, can, and putting on the roof. Right. But not everybody processes information quite like that. And I so can it's, understand that. It's fascinating I mean, to sure. me to listen, you know, because like I, I've listened to interviews with uh, Stephen King and he's all over the place with the yeah. way he writes his right. books. So, right. you know, and, and of course he's one of the most prolific horror and and, and, and drama writers, you Absolutely. know, this generation. So he's, he's the rock star of 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 writers. He's just I mean, <laughs> and he can write so many varied types of things. Like I have read so many things by him and every single read has a different tone. It's almost like it could have been written by different people. And of course, you know, yeah, if you know sure. anything about his life and the ups and downs and the roller coaster that it's been and the times where he was on hard drugs and right. the things he wrote during those times definitely have a different feel than the things when he became sober. So Well, he's been writing for 50 years yeah. now. So when you have a prolific career over that long of a period of time, you do have different eras, so to speak. And you'll you know? eventually also experience that, I'm sure. Well, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, you know, you, uh, you, you, you went to school for it. You, you know, wrote all these short stories. You decided, I'm going to turn this into a novel. You did some tweaking. You turned it into a novel. So tell everybody kind of, how do you get into this world? You know, did you self-publish the first time? I did. Okay. I did. I did start off uh, self-publishing. Uh, the first uh, three or four books were all self-published. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I did, I did do one thing that was kind of interesting. I think it helped me a whole lot in terms of, making that step up to the next level. Uh, about halfway through, I had somebody come to me with an idea and he said, you ought to start your own publishing company, just a small publishing company. Publish what you feel like doing, what you write or what you feel like publishing, but give it a name that you can s sort of hide behind, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. it's not just self-published by Tim Bryant, it's Tim Bryant published by and so we we started our own, me and several friends started our own publishing company called Behooven Press. And we uh, published uh, most of the Dutch, well, all of the Dutch Courage books became published through that. And then a couple of other things that I did were published through Behooven Press. Plus I published some other, I published one Joe Lansdale book, a couple of books of poetry, things like that. So when you say I, we publish these books, exactly what does that entail um does that the actual printing and the distribution or no we were able to uh go through there there's a uh, company that works in tandem with amazon okay uh called kdp printing and i use them because uh well i, I looked at a, there are several different places you can go but i did those because uh you would automatically be put on amazon and i knew that 90% of America buys their books on Amazon. Sure. Even as a bookstore owner, <laughs> I am well aware of that fact. Yeah. So, so I went through them, um, and, and it, it, it was a very successful thing. Uh, what happened was, uh, you know, a lot of people self-publish, and there's a bad side of that, and there's a good side, because there's a lot of bad self-publishing. I hate to say it. Yeah, well, yeah. Just, no, I agree with that well, statement. <laughs> address the elephant in the room, kind of. Sure. Self-publishing has a bad reputation uh -huh. amongst a lot of people, especially amongst publishers. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. Uh, but it does allow, if, if, you're, if you're good at, enough at what you do, the I think the... Good stuff does rise to the top. Yeah. Had, you, had some, you tried sending your book out, like your manuscript, to different publishers, and, and, and there was the rejection? Or did you just immediately go, I'm going to just self-publish this and I, just skip I, all I, that? Actually, I just went straight to the self-publishing. Okay. And then we did the Behooven Press, which I felt like was the next step. And I was starting to look at, funny enough, this is the way it happened. I was starting to look at taking the next step into the real publishing world, as it were, and all of a sudden, I got this, uh, I think it was an email from uh, Gary, no, I'm going to forget his name, Gary, um, sorry, Goldsmith at Kensington in New York, which is one of the ma five major publishers yeah. in America. I got an unsolicited email from him saying, I've read your four Dutch Courage books. I want to sign you to write some Westerns for Kensington. And uh, I thought it was a joke. I thought somebody was like 
you know, messing with you, messing with me at oh, first, wow. you know, because be, that's not the way it happens. It yeah, just no, doesn't I agree. Happen that way. But it turned out that uh, somebody had told him you ought to read Tim Bryant stuff, and he read my four Dutch Courage books and got wow. in touch with me. In fact, he went so far as to say, "I love the voice that you have in the voice in, in in the Dutch Courage. Can you write?" be a, a couple of westerns in that kind of a voice you know not yeah. mimicking it but with that same kind of style and i said basically you want me to i always look at it this way you want me to take the fedora off his head and put a cowboy hat on yeah. his head and you want me to take him out of his jalopy and put him on a horse yeah. he said basically yes <laughs> i said i can do that where do i sign yeah so it just it came to me and 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 i always tell people it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. It, it did, but it doesn't. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, you can wait a thousand years for something I've heard, like that I've read so many interviews with different author, authors saying that they sent out manuscripts yes. and got rejection after rejection after rejection. Yes, and that's the way it usually happens. Yeah. But with me, they came to me. I, I had written, like I said, the four books, and, and thank God they were good enough. And I knew, <laughs> and I knew they were. And the third book in that four-book series, I had one... Uh, book people in Austin, which is one of the biggest yeah, independent yep. bookstores in America. They yep. do this big thing at the end of every year where they announce their top five authors of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I won, I was in the top five wow. authors of the year 2014 for the third book in the Dutch Courage that's, series that's called amazing. Spirit Congratulations. Trap. Yeah. So that lifted my, yeah, that lifted my career as it were a little bit higher. And, yeah. and, probably was instrumental in Gary finding me and reading my books, actually giving me the time of day to read my books. Yeah. So it, Yeah, it gives you a little bit of validation, you yeah. know. So that's how I got into Kensington. And once I got there, right at the very same time, I got an agent. And I'll, I'll tell you real quick, they were going to sign me for X amount of dollars. And I can't remember exactly what. I wouldn't say exactly anyway, I don't think. But they were going to sign me for a, a certain amount. And I got this, I got an agent, um, and she went in the door and talked to him and got me like 30% more wow. right, right off the bat. And she gets her 15%. Right. So she she made her 15% plus some, you know. Yeah. yeah. And she's been my agent ever since. Love so. it. So you find that it's worth it to have her oh, kind of inter interceding for absolutely you. Absolutely it is. Yeah. I, you know, I've gotten indoors or she's gotten indoors that I could never get in. Yeah. So. And putting your book, putting your, put your things in front of the eyes that it needs to, you know, yep. be in front of. That's that, good. That's her job. And she does. She does. So it's job. worth it to you, you would say. Absolutely. I would tell anybody out there. You know, getting getting a uh, deal with a publisher is hard. Get an agent, and and it gets a little bit easier. So mm -hmm. maybe don't concentrate quite so much on getting that big publishing deal. Concentrate on getting an agent, and they can help get, you get yeah, into get some steps. rooms that you won't be able to get in by yourself. Now, I know that a lot of authors, especially in their early days, uh, you know, are part of, like, writer's groups and, and different things so that they right. can write and practice and critique each other's stuff and, you know, learn to take feedback yep. and, and, you know, edit. That's invaluable. Um, and I was about yes. to ask you, have Absolutely. you been a part of those groups and what was it like? <laughs> oh, yes. I, 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 it's invaluable. It, I, well, if you've got a good group right. what, what you can count on. Mm -hmm. I mean, a good group is just the best thing you can have as a writer, somebody who can really give you good ideas. And I had that in the early stages of my career. Uh, well, I had it in school mm -hmm. primarily when we were workshopping our and workshopping, I, that's the and word. workshopping is horrific. As a student, you're just horrified to put your stuff out there. Yeah. But you learn that it's actually an, an invaluable tool in yeah. becoming a better writer. And what I found out was I learned more from workshopping other people's stuff than I did from my own sometimes. So we had this group of five or six people that that we workshopped a lot of my early stuff, you know. And then when I lost that, I mean, this was more as a student, okay? Mm -hmm. So now as a, as a writer, I'm writing these novels and turning them into my agent, turning them into the publisher, and I miss that little step there. I'm like, to this day, I do miss that feedback. You want a focus group. I want a focus group. And some writers do have focus groups. They mm -hmm. have, what, the, what do they call them, uh, 
preliminary readers or mm-hmm. something like that, you yeah. know, where they'll t- send them out and, and get feedback. The ARCs, the advanced reader copies? Well, advanced reader copies, of course, there are those too. Mm-hmm. So there are different ways you can do that now, but uh, I, I do miss having just that automatic feedback of, uh, of you know, the workshop experience. Yeah. So I don't uh, think people realize that, you know, when you, when you're a writer or an artist or someone who's a creative of some kind and a right. musician and you, you know, it takes a lot of courage in a way to put that art out there for other people to it does. critique. Yes. Constructively or not so constructively. And so, you know, kind of maybe map out slightly in the best way you possibly can. How do you overcome that fear of putting your work out there for people to judge, whether it be good or bad? And, and then how do you not take it? How do you get to a place where you don't take that personally? So that, that you can learn from it and use it to the best of your, you know, ability, but not get too bogged down in some of the things that people can say that can be hurtful. It's such a great question, and, and I don't know if there's a really good answer to that. But, because, yeah, sure, but because, what is your answer? Uh, well, as, as creative people, we tend to be kind of uh, fragile. Yeah. Sometimes we have fragile <laughs> egos, you yeah. know. So I think practice just doing it over and over because the first time two or three times I did it it was horrifying and I would just be in a sweat waiting for and when people um, had really good feedback sometimes if it was I I would take it as criticism and you take it personal you just tend to do that right but I think what happened was as I learned to give other people good feedback that's how you learn to take good feedback because we would have these workshops and there would be like you would have a, a, a story. Yeah. So I would be reading your story and I would see really good ways to make it better. It'd be a great story, you know, maybe, but I could, what if you did this? I think it would be really effective. And you start to see, oh, now I can understand better how to take the feedback that's coming my way. Once Absolutely. You, I think, so I think it's practice and learning how to give creative feedback to other people. And knowing that the person, that these people in these workshopping groups have your best interest at heart. You know, they just yes. want to, they just yes. want to help you. So if you, if well, you take true. that into your mind and go, they're not judging or critiquing me in a bad way. They're, they're offering me and you find, the best advice they can. That's very true. And you find out who those people are because you may have people that are vindictive and are just trying to kind of cut you down a little bit you find out those kinds of people and you do find out that that, that what he's telling you if that's where he's coming from is not very helpful sure so you find out what's helpful and what's not helpful and uh i think um you know it works itself out that way you know like i said when i started doing that workshop process i hated it i just I just, it's scary. It, it, was, it was scary <laughs> to me because I was very shy. Believe it or not, I was a very shy person. I still am. Mm-hmm. But I was very shy to put my work out there and have it criticized. You like put that, so much so. In, in, in emotion and, and, and just like your soul into these things. Is sure. that when you put them out there, sure. it's, a, it's a fragile glass piece that you're like, sure. ah, you know, here, don't break it. You know, because I think we do, you know, especially my younger years when I was more into writing, you know, that was the, that was the thing. This is my baby. I've produced this thing and right. please don't criticize my baby too hard, you know? Right. And, but then that doesn't, if you, if people handle you with kid gloves, when with anything creative, you're never going to grow as an artist right. because you won't move past this like little space right. that you've created, right. you know, and, and knowing those people who are going to give you constructive criticism yeah. that will make you better is, yeah. is the key. You, you, like. just, you do learn which ones you, you gather around the people that help you and, and build you up. Yeah. And, and you learn that through that process. And again, I think you also learn through giving them criticism I think that really was the key with me was when I could start seeing how I was helpful to them that made it much I like easier. that you turn that around on yourself it's, it's more of a it, you well, were self-reflective about it like well, I was getting yeah. this criticism so this could help me if I did that right well yeah. I, I lo- what I said earlier is very true I, I found out that I would sometimes learn more from critiquing somebody else's story than I learned from my own story mm-hmm. sometimes and the worst feedback you can get is oh it's great yeah it's like okay so what can but, i do to make what? it better <laughs> but what oh else? it's just great yeah it's it's good 
that doesn't help you any. That yeah. doesn't help. Yeah. It takes a while to figure that out, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, it does. Well, it's, especially if you if you're somebody who doesn't want to hurt the other person's feelings. And sure. So oh, it's great. Sure. But but but, but what what could you, what can be improved upon? You know, it, like right. it, you know. Right. Yeah. I, and I a lot of times when you say what can help be improved upon, they'll say, I don't know. Well, that's the person you don't really want in your workshop. Right. You know, their their synapses don't fire the same way. Right, right. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you. You know, uh, I know that you know you started writing about thirteen years ago, and so you know the modern era of writing is is, is was kind of already upon us. But uh, now there's you know more demand for say like Kindle books or digital right, copies, right. and and not so much the the hard copy or physical copy of a book. And and as an author, what is your perspective on that? Like, do you have an opinion? Does it bother you? You know, what's what's your take? Well, I'm a bookstore owner, so I have a slightly <laughs> different opinion as a bookstore owner. Sure. But as a writer, I think it's all great. Yeah. And, and really, I do. I think it's great. I think I'm not a Kindle reader. I, I just don't, I, I, I don't work that way. I've tried, and I just, uh, I just can't. You need to, you're tactile. I, you I, need I, the yeah, book in your exactly. hands. Yeah. yeah. But if somebody else is reading my books, I don't care what they're reading them on. We also uh, they're also mostly available on audiobook, and I love that. People, oh, really? Yeah, and I love that people, uh, you know, read about Dutch or hear about Dutch on the audiobooks or mm-hmm. or the the two westerns. They're on, available on audiobook as well. Mm-hmm. So I love that. I, I think it's great. I, I, I use mean, a Kindle when I'm on vacation and I'm going somewhere, and I, ha- sure. I can take 15 books with me. You I have know? a lot of people tell me that. I but think that's valid. I mean, at home, a, I, I'm reading a regular. If you're book. on an airplane or something, it's a great thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Or if you're on, you know, I understand it has its place. I, so I, I, I don't have any problem with it at all. Personally, I, I like audiobooks, so I'm glad yeah. to hear that I can uh, purchase a couple of your books and yeah, listen to them. You can. I are, have, are they I, on Audible or Libro? Audible. Okay, great. Audible. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, I have a hard time. Li- I, I I would probably, it would be great if I could, but I am not an auditory learner. I have right. to see it. I have to yeah. read it. And so Megan was like, you should try these, like, you know, audiobooks. And I've tried it, and I just, I start to, I can't, I can't pay attention long enough. I do the my same mind, thing. <laughs> I do the exact same else. thing, but but like my parents, like when they go on a trip. Yeah, they want to listen to a book. A lot of they? people I found out will do them, you know, use them in the car. I can't do and it. And just listen in the, I can't either. My There's, mind just strays. It does. I, I they'll it. be, and I'll, I'll come back to it. My mind will come back to it, and it's like I missed 10 minutes of the story, and I'm like, oh, Right, what where happened? was I? What happened? You have to try to figure out how to rewind it back. <laughs> right. yeah, I, can't, I can't do it. Yeah, I, I'm it's, just, it's weird how people's brains work because I old school. I want to I want to be able to do the audiobook thing, but yeah. I will miss so much information that way. I just love that it's out there for people yeah. though, because I think more people are reading probably today than ever have. Yeah. You yeah. know, a lot of people say, "Well, nobody reads anymore. Nobody reads anymore." We're I don't reading think in that's a different true. way. We're reading in a different way, exactly. Yeah. But I think more people are probably reading than ever. Yeah. 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 Well, and as a bookstore owner, you would you would know that. Well, think about the <laughs> yeah. commutes that people make, right? Sure. Some people sure. have a one, two hour long commute. Every day. Every sometimes. single day. Yeah, and right, so right. that time it can be spent listening yeah. to an audiobook or a podcast and or a whatever. And a lot of people do that. And I, yeah. I make a commute to Houston fairly often. That's yeah. you know, two hours for me and then two hours back when I'm coming home. So I have a lot of I've I read more last year than I had in several years because yep. I was able to, I, I got a service where I could, sure. you know, purchase audiobooks. Sure. And, um, yeah, that was really, really valuable for me because I was able to read a lot of books that maybe I had picked up a physical copy but just couldn't, right. couldn't find the time right. to, to right. read them. So. I think that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. And, and we had a discussion the other day in the store whether if you listen to a book all the way through, have you read that book? Mm-hmm. And they were saying, no, well, you haven't actually read it. And I was like, yes, you have. If, yeah. you, if you've listened to the book all the way through, it's the same as it's your mom. It's a different mom. type of reading. It's like the same as your mom reading you a book as, when you go to bed at night. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's a reading of the book. So. That was the thing I was very adamant on when our kids were little, was reading to them every day. Sure. You know that, that that's sure. I think that's how they picked up on the I reading. Think so. That's how I they think learned that does English it. language, and they, right. you know, and so we we went through what the entire Chronicles of Narnia series, yep. Harry wow. Potter. Potter. Wow. Something else. I want to we say we did the Mandy book series. The Mandy book series. Yeah. So it, like you know that was a thing that you know a habit that I had had when I was a kid sure. that my parents did with me, and I, I knew that was something I wanted to pass on to my children. So I think that's very important. I think um, it is. Too. It's it's kind of establishes a very important relationship. Reading it, it gives you education. 
And yeah. it opens you up to these different worlds. And it really sparks creativity and imagination. And so whether you're reading it with your eyeballs in right. a physical copy of a book or you're listening to it, right. I think that's, yeah, it's very important. And especially with children in their early development, reading to them is like... It makes all the difference. That's the thing to I do. I think it does too, yeah. Um, I wanted yeah. to kind of ask you... You know, as an author and having, you know, kind of an in in that world, what's your perspective? What's a better way to ask this? Um, what is something in pop culture today within the uh, literary world that you just find so irritating? <laughs> like that's just, it's popular, but you're just like, Ugh, well, I don't, I don't get that. Or I don't understand why that became a thing. Well, do you know are, what I'm talking about? I, I do. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, of course I do. There are always trends. I mean, and you can follow trends back all the way to the 1800s. I mean, as far. Sure. But you know, the sparkly vampire thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that was one that I was not very fond of the le in the least. Uh, it, it, it seems like there, there's always some trend that's going, that's hot right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somebody will have a big hit with something, and then all the— all Everybody's of, doing it's, it. Yeah, the, the market is flooded with yeah. these second-rate— Mm -hmm. I tend to find the, the fan fiction redos of certain yes. things like that to yes. be actually worse in a way. Oh, they can be, yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, you know, I always question how, how did this get popular? You know, I uh, nobody asked me, but I really hate the dystopian <laughs> thing that's going on. Dystopian is getting a little bit old. Like, it's like the glittery vampire. Well, yes, so I yes. Was, yes. Like it's getting a little Games, bit old. The Hunger Games was interesting. And then it spawned oh, like a gosh. dozen copies. They're still going of now. the same thing. Oh, I know, I know. And it. I'm just like, okay, well, the Hunger Games did it. Y'all don't have to do these. Quite honestly, crap. And I'm not gonna tell like what series I'm talking right. about, but we everybody all, knows we all know. <laughs> there are right. some really crappy right. YA young adult yes, dystopian like book series that but, are but out there. But they know there's this big crowd of young people who enjoy who them. Are are just. They're gaga sucking for them, them uh, sucking them up as fast as you can yeah. release them. Do you think ultimately and that that it 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 puts a spotlight on reading and book books in the literary world, even though it is kind of from a you know from certain authors' perspective kind of garbage material. It does illuminate the the genre, the 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 industry, and and so it helps everybody in a way, even if it is. Eh. Well, there's an, <laughs> there's an argument that it does that. I'm not sure if I agree with okay, that or not. Okay. Yet. I don't know. It could be. There's always been really bad writing. Sure. I mean, you know, they had the little dime novels back in the old day, and it was, it was not meant to be literary, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was meant to just satisfy. I don't read the quick. Nora Roberts books for their intellect. Okay, they're exactly. a great trashy exactly. novel to read there's, when you're just like wanting to sit by the pool. <laughs> and there's a place for trashy novels. Yeah. I mean, and yes. you can write a good trashy novel versus a bad trashy novel right. too. Absolutely. So there's always quality and not quality. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter if you're just. I mean. I would rather read a really well-written dystopian novel right now than a poorly written whatever else. I mean, mm -hmm. even though I'm a little bit tired of dystopian novels right now. Yeah. And I would never, I don't think I would write one. Mm -hmm. um, if I did, I'd make darn sure that it was a good one. Yeah. I mean, I think quality still perseveres in the long run, even though at any given time you're going to have a lot of people reading a lot of really bad, trashy stuff. Oh, just yeah. because it's accessible it's a and guilty you know, pleasure. And I, and, I, you know. and I know a lot of people want to read that book that they know how it ends. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which never, that's that's the probably the, the one that really bothers me when we're talking about things that we don't like. Yeah. Is this readership that really wants to read the same novel over and over and over again, which escapism has always been a part of reading. So I understand that part of it, but. You know. Well, Nora Roberts for, follows a formula, and yes, I'm not I'm not yes. trashing on her. She's been writing for years and years well, and years, and has many for, different it's pseudonyms. For her that very she, well. Yeah, she writes under a bunch of different pseudonyms. <laughs> yes. She has different types of genres that she writes. You know, uh, and and they all fo follow a formula, and so you know it's right. going to be this right. and this, and then this happens at the end. You don't read it for the intellectual stimulation right. and necessarily. A, and a lot but, of people love and, those formulas. And I and admire they, that she has been able to take that yeah. and make a career out of it. Sure. Whether I, you uh, know, absolutely. 
necessarily think, you know, I'm going to brag about, well, I was well, reading her books at the pool the other day. You know, you don't do that. You well, know, there's but lots then of you... writers that have done that same thing. John Grisham. Sure. I mean, you oh, know, yeah. He's they, definitely a formula a writer. A formula writer, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't he wouldn't make any bones about it. If he was sitting right here, he'd tell you, yeah. yes, I've got a formula. This is what it is. And it works, and it for, works him. for him. Yes, you it know? does. And, yeah. and I think you do what you know and what works for you. And, and I, you know, to take it a step further, I probably have a formula. I, I, sure. I would be the last person to be able to tell you what it was. <laughs> you could probably look over my shoulder or maybe ask my girlfriend. She might be able to tell sure. you. I don't know. But, I, you know, I'm not I guess, knocking the formula. I guess Sometimes it all, helps. You I guess know? we all intrinsically have a formula if we get from A to Z because I can't sit down and, you know, every book I write is different. But there are themes that, uh, that I even notice after 11 books that keep coming back up yeah. over and over and over again. So there is a formula there. And, and, and I think a lot of what we do writing is subconscious. It's in the back of our head. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, you, you, you'll be, you know, when I say that I don't know where I'm going when I write the novel, I kind of set the ship in a certain direction and follow it. Mm-hmm. That's true, but I think in the back of my head, there's something that knows where I'm going a little bit more sure. than I'm willing to admit, maybe. And that's where the formula sure. comes into play. And it also is it's like it's the tenor of your... Sure. It's a tone. It's, yeah, you know, and every is. author, I think, has that. So it's yes. hard to escape yes. it completely. Oh, well, yeah, you can't escape um, it. I think we always write about ourselves. I think there's certain things we just can't escape. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, we talked about what you don't like in the literary world. Let's talk about what you do love. What is, it, you know, you're excited to see happening? Uh, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. It's easier to critique, isn't it? <laughs> it yeah, it, it is. What What do I like? Well, I, I love good books. I still love any good book. And, mm-hmm. I, and I don't, there's not a one thing I always tell people when they come in, I, I have a lot of kids that come in from the uh, writing program, and, and they'll ask me questions, you know, the program that I graduated from. And I kind of feel like a patron saint of the uh, of that program or something, you know. Right. They'll come in, they know that I'm the first one that graduated, and they'll ask me questions. And one thing I always tell them is to read. If, if you think you're a mystery writer, don't just read mystery novels read everything read yeah. outside your read poetry you'll be surprised how even reading poetry might affect what you're writing so I like a lot of I like everything and I like to be surprised by what I like I don't like to sit there and think this is what I like this is what's going to touch me because any human being if they're writing from their heart can touch me it, it could be an Indian writer who uh, has been translated into English even mm-hmm. you know it, it can be something that as far away as it can be, but if it has that human element, it can touch another writer or another reader. Yeah. So I just like the magic of reading, and that's why I like the magic of writing. It all comes together to me. You it's, know? it's like a, being transported to another world. That's one of the things I love about reading. No matter what type of genre I'm in at that particular moment, it takes me to a different right. reality of exactly. some kind, exactly. you know, and I feel like that's that's really appealing. Now, I know that doesn't, you know... People do that with movies or television, and and you can obviously. Sure. But uh, sure. I think reading, you get to put, you get to cast the characters, you get to imagine the scene. It just, you know, it just never gets old to me. I, I, I'm continually finding something that just turns me on in a way that just excites me and makes me want to write, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean makes me want to write something like that, but you know, creativity it gets you spurs excited. creativity, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, so it, it's always just the magic of, of doing it. I'm writing a novel right now, and this, in fact, this morning before we came here, I was writing, and I'm I just crossed, uh, I've just gone over 50,000 words in this wow. next novel. Wow. So that's kind of a big thing. When you hit 50,000, it's all downhill after that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, pretty, <laughs> is pretty, that the rule? Pretty, pretty much. <laughs> With me, it is. Good deal. With George R. R. Martin, he's barely getting started. Yeah, yeah, that's like a that's but, a but, scene he's describing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but with me, that means I'm starting to wrap things up, and it's just so exciting to. I mean, again, my girlfriend, my son can probably tell you I, I get as excited now, and maybe more so, to write a really good story. I get as excited as I ever have, you know, yeah. and probably more so, to be honest with you. I think what I'm writing now is the best thing I've ever written. 
And of course, all writers will probably tell you that. Your but, current project is always the one that's the best, right? But, but, if, you're, <laughs> but if you're not getting better, I'm something you're doing something wrong because you do get better. It's like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger you get. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think I am getting better. In fact, you know, having these first books republished, I, I went back and looked at some of them. And the first thing I, I mean, the first two books still sell like, the first book is probably one of my biggest sellers, maybe still my biggest seller because it's been out there the longest. Sure. But when I look at it, the main thing I think is, my gosh, I could write that better now. Sure. And, yeah. and part of me wants to go back and touch it up, but you know, and I had the opportunity to change some things, but I didn't. I just mm-hmm. said it's got to stay. There's something about there's something to be said to be able to look back over a career that spans decades and look at that first book and go, look how far I've come. Because if right. you had taken the opportunity to tweak things and and fix certain things, you know, y- you might not have been able to see the difference it, in your it growth. It would have messed something up. Yeah. Sure. So it, I think there's have. there's some merit in leaving it. I think so, so that too. It's kind of it shows the milestone yeah. of your career. And that first book is magical in its own way. I mean, it's in a way that I can never recreate because it was the first time I did it. So uh, um, when I look back at some of the elements in that story, I'm, I'm just amazed. You get far enough away from them. When you look at them, you forget writing it and you just read it as a, a reader. Mm-hmm. And some of it still is kind of brilliant to me. I'm like, wow, did I really write that? That's pretty good. Yeah. You know, so overall, it's a wash. It's it's good. It, there are parts that I would do better, but parts, I'm like, wow. Yeah. So. Well, you know, it, it, it's going to cement the, the, the journey of your career, you sure. know, and looking back at it. So. Sure. I've, I've got another question for you before we wrap up. Okay. Probably the most important question. Oh, okay. How do you overcome writer's block? Oh, what a great question. One of my favorite questions. You know, can I be honest with you? Yes, be completely honest. I don't believe there is any such thing. Okay, great. I do not believe in writer's block. I had a friend of, that used to tell me that. I don't believe in writer's block. And I was like, well, you're not living in my skin then. <laughs> the longer I go, the more convinced I am that he was exactly right. There is no such thing as writer's block. It's okay. something that we have manufactured to keep ourselves from sitting down and writing. And I hate to say that, that sounds a little bit harsh, but as writers, sometimes we're looking for some reason not to write, I think. Yeah. Now you can you can write terrible. There are days that you're gonna sit down and write something that's absolutely garbage. And that's 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 just normal. Any yeah. any writer. J.K. Rowling has days, I'm sure, where what she whatever she writes, she just crumples it up and she throws it away and we never know about it. Mm-hmm. But I think, by and large, and there may be certain cases where you have some kind of psychological thing that you have to work through, but I think, by and large, you can sit down and write. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you can say, I've got writer's block. Well, sit down and write something. Even write, if it's write just a, a stream of consciousness. Even if it's stream of consciousness, <laughs> yeah. even if it's crappy. Yeah. I mean, even if, if it's no good and you never show anybody. I always tell people, if you want to be a writer, write every day. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you just write two or three sentences. I always say write 15 minutes a day. That's always my advice to people who want to write. Write 15 minutes a day at the end of the month. You'll be surprised how far you've gone. Yeah. And, and on a lot of those days, you'll do your 15 minutes and look up, and all of a sudden it's an hour later, mm-hmm. too. I mean, you have great days. You have bad days. That's just human nature. As a writer, it yeah. is. I don't think there's any such thing as writer's block. I, I think love it's it. all just a ploy that we stick that roadblock out there and say, I've got writer's block, I'm not gonna write today. Yeah, very yeah. good. Well, thank you. Yep. Tell everybody where they can find your books and find your bookstore. Well, my books, you can find my books in my bookstore for sure. <laughs> uh, the, the bookstore is The Boss Light. We're in downtown Nacogdoches, 123 East Main, easy to remember, 123. Yep. Uh, other than that, you can find them just about anywhere. They're on Amazon, of course. They're on Barnes and Noble. All the, you know, the, the major booksellers, major internet places, and any bookstore you go in, if they're not on the shelf, they can order them. Very so good. just ask for Tim Bryant books, and they will be able to look them up in their database and. And they should be able to get them to you. Very good. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on and, and offering this, um, you know, perspective from a writer. You know, you own a business, but then you also participate as an author in that business by writing books. And I think so. my, I think my main job is a writer. Yeah. People ask me which one comes first, and sometimes it's the chicken egg thing. But, <laughs> yeah. but I think 
at the end of the day, if the bookstore went out of business, I would still be a writer. Yeah. If I stopped being a writer, I don't know why I would even want to own a bookstore anymore. So, yeah. so I totally feel that. I, I, I feel more and more every day that goes by. I feel more like a writer. Good so. deal. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this uh, fun little extra episode uh, where you get a. A perspective from a writer, an actual writer who's been in the trenches. And uh, uh, Tim, thanks for coming on and, and, and sharing sure. your story with us. Absolutely. And, uh, Pleased to do it. We wish you all the best in your future endeavors. And uh, I will be uh, definitely d- downloading some books and reading them. And Thank you very much. Going forward. I want to. I love mystery. So, yeah. Life is a mystery. Yes, it is. All right, guys. Well, that's it for this episode. We will catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in. And we hope everybody has a great and wonderful day. Have a good day. Do you have a story to tell? We want to hear it. If you'd like to be a guest on our podcast and share your story, contact us on our website at painpoints.com or any of the social media linked on our website. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. We'd appreciate a review, a like, or a comment to let us know what you think. You can find all of our podcasts linked on our website under the podcast tab. Once again, thanks for joining us, and we want to wish everybody a wonderful day.